the mid-1990s, things were in a state of change in Formula 1. The death of Senna, followed by the rise of Schumacher, and then the slow demise of the Williams team through the later part of that decade, to then bounce back when the BMW money came at the turn of the millennium. And after winning his World Championship in 1996, Damon Hill was gone from Williams and off to Arrows for a 1997 season that was just a... Well, it was just a stopgap until he could get something a little bit better. Whenever there is talk about the 1996 or 1997 season, there's always a multitude of comments saying it's a disgrace that Damon was sacked. But he wasn't. Basically, Damon's 1995 was so terrible that Sir Frank Williams had basically signed somebody else instead. So when Damon's contract ran out at the end of 1996, there would be someone new to bring in. And that man was High Tyrell Frentzen. Frentzen had been part of the same Sauber and Mercedes sports car setup as Carl Wendlinger and Michael Schumacher. And while in sports cars, he was being touted as being faster than the future seven-time champion. But some guys are just faster or better in one discipline of racing over another. There's a few guys in endurance racing that never broke through in single-seaters, for instance. I mean, there's some there right now, as it so happens. So with Frentzen signed at the end of 1995 and Jacques Villeneuve under contract until the end of 1998, Damon was surplus to requirements and needed another team to race for. So this then means there were two hot prospect drivers at Williams for the 1997 season, a season that on paper should have just been, well, Bill knows, but Ferrari was bouncing back thanks to the dream team they were building at Maranello. So while 1996 was just between Hill and Villeneuve, 1997 was looking more like it would have been Villeneuve, Schumacher, Frentzen, and one of the McLaren drivers. And Williams stamped down that authority in the first race of the season. Villeneuve was 1.7 seconds faster than his teammate and Schumacher was over 2 seconds off the pole time. But in the race, both Williams cars retired. Villeneuve was fired off at Turn 1 in an incident with Irvine and Herbert and this left Frentzen out on track to potentially score an unlikely debut win. But then, Frentzen ran into two problems. For a decent portion of the race, he had to manage his brakes because they were getting too hot. And then on lap 40, when he pitted for the second time, his right rear got stuck and lost a chunk of time in the pits, but managed to recover to second when Schumacher had to make an unscheduled stop. But then, with three laps to go, one of the rear brakes failed, and he ended his race in the same spot Villeneuve had done on lap 1. It was Coulthard that would take the unlikely win. At the Brazilian Grand Prix, Frentzen would actually be a little bit closer in terms of a time delta to Villeneuve, but he would actually start further down the grid because everybody else had somehow found some pace. He started that race 9 tenths of a second off Villeneuve, and while JV would go on to win the race comfortably, well I say comfortably, he was about 4 seconds from Gerhard Berger, Frentzen was nowhere and was nearly lapped. For Argentina, Frentzen was back on the front row of the grid, but his clutch would go on him this time and would still score no points. Yes, by the third round of the 1997 season, the guy in probably the best car on the grid had no points. However, at Imola there was a breakthrough. He was once again second on the grid, but this time the deficit to Villeneuve was just three and a half tenths. And despite losing out to Michael at the start, Frentzen was able to keep up with the Ferrari and then jump it in the first round of stops. With Villeneuve retiring with gearbox issues, it left Frentzen out there to withstand a late charge from the Michael, and he took the first victory of his career, with that win putting him in equal third place with Coulthard, Irvine, Berger and Hakkinen. Just goes to show how the reliability was in those days if you can only score 10 points after four races, and be third in the standings. I mean, obviously the points structure was a little bit different, but my point remains. So the opening few rounds of the season hadn't gone the way Frentzen and Williams would have wanted the season to get going, but at Monaco he'd score his first ever pole position, only to not finish the race in the absolutely pouring rain. In Spain it was another non-point score, with Frentzen being way off the pace, but for the rest of the season, every race he finished, he'd finish in the points and all but two of those races, he was on the podium. This is the consistency Williams would have been hoping for at the start of the season. The only thing that got in the way of this was a run of three consecutive non-finishes at Silverstone, Hockenheim and Hungary. At Silverstone, he stalled on the grid, then had to start at the back, only to be punted off by Jos Verstappen on the opening lap. At the German Grand Prix, he was taken out by Irvine as Irvine cut across him at Turn 1, and then in Hungary, it was, well, it was just a fuel leak or a fuel pump failure or something like that, so either way, all three retirements, not even his fault. But despite those retirements, it was a string of great results. Fourth in Montreal, second at Manicourt, then the three retirements but four consecutive third place finishes at Spa, Monza, the A1 ring and the Nürburgring, followed by a second place in Japan. 
The final race of the season was a sixth place at Jerez that was good enough to get him third in the driver's standings, obviously bumped up to second due to Schumacher's exclusion following the collision with Villeneuve. So the 1997 season was as expected then. Franson finished second, which is where Williams would have wanted him to be, a 1-2 finish in the driver's standings for Williams. It's the best they could have hoped for, but it doesn't really tell the full story because Franson finished with exactly half the points of Jacques, and then that doesn't tell the full story either. So let's go back to the results and look at where Franson lost out. In Australia, he had the pit stop and brake problem. Argentina, he lost his clutch. Monaco, he dropped it in the treacherous conditions. Silverstone and Hockenheim, he was taken out through no fault of his own. The fuel pump issue at Hungary, no fault of his own. And only one of those retirements that he had in that season was through driver error. And that was a race where most of the field did exactly the same thing. The only two races he was really truly off the pace were Brazil and Spain. And at Spain, he was second on the grid only to balls up the start. And by San Marino, he'd got the qualifying deficit to the pole time down to less than half a second, which in those days was super close. The following season in 1998, Williams was going to be off the pace anyway. They'd lost Adrian Newey to McLaren. Renault had withdrawn from Formula One as a full-on engine supplier, and Williams had to basically run 1997 spec engines and develop the FW19 into the all-new, all-red, FW20. Frenson was able to score a podium at the opening round in Australia and Villeneuve was able to get two podiums at Hockenheim and the Hungara ring, but the team would be third in the constructors, well off Ferrari and McLaren. So for 1999, Frenson would be on the move again. The deal was a straight swap between Sir Frank and Eddie Jordan. Following the 1998 Belgian Grand Prix where Damon Hill had won in, okay let's call it somewhat controversial circumstances, the relationship between Eddie Jordan and Ralph Schumacher had deteriorated. Long story short, Eddie managed to get Ralph and his brother Michael to buy Ralph out of his contract for a few million, and then they basically swapped the two drivers. And at one point during the 1999 season, Frentzen looked like he could actually win the World Championship. Okay, Michael breaking his leg at Silverstone helped with that, but still HHF managed to win two races, one at Manicourt and one at Monza. If he'd won that year's European Grand Prix with Irvine and Hacken and both struggling big time, it would have meant that the three of them would have been equal on points with just two races left to run. So why did it go so well at a lesser team compared to the better team, if that makes any sense? Well, it's down to the way that the teams are run. At Sauber, he had the fatherly figure in Peter Sauber helping him along, and they'd had this very long relationship which went back to the 80s with the whole sports car thing, because we've already established that Frenson was in the Sauber Mercedes sports car program back in, back in the Group C days. But when Frentzen moved to Williams, Frank and Patrick operated in a totally different way. Frank and Patrick were taskmasters. Having read the autobiographies of David Coulthard and Damon Hill, two Formula Williams drivers, it seems that Frank and Patrick ran the place with a super serious attitude, where it was all about winning. I'm sure they did have fun, but I bet it was like having that super strict teacher that you absolutely hated in year seven, but by the time year 10 or 11 rolls around, you realize that actually, this guy isn't so much of an arsehole after all, and he's actually all right with a good sense of humor. What is Mr. Ashmole up to these days? He's gotta be pushing 80 now. On the flip side, Eddie Jordan was fun loving and was there for the pure love of racing. The environment was a lot more relaxed and because Frentzen needed an arm around him rather than being dealt tough love, he was able to gel better at Jordan and Sauber than he ever did at Williams. But as we've seen from the results of that 1997 season, the vast majority of the underperformance we saw that year wasn't actually his fault. I mean, maybe if Frank and Patrick had helped pick him up after Australia, maybe Brazil wouldn't have been as terrible and he could have had a few extra points on the board, but I don't know. And that French Grand Prix win is made even more remarkable due to what happened at Canada. Franson put his Jordan in the wall and did some damage to his knee and to his leg. He had loads of tiny micro fractures in his kneecap and actually split his leg down the middle. He won the French Grand Prix with a broken leg. But that was as good as it got, to be honest. Things once again changed around him. Honda started turning more attention to BAR and Jordan was losing out. There were disagreements between Frentzen and Eddie and he was sacked midway through the 2001 season with 18 months still to run on his contract. Then his next two teams collapsed, Frost and Arrows, with 2003 being his final season of competition, where he beat out his hotly rated German teammate Nick Heidfeld. So then, did Frentzen underachieve? As we've seen, not really. 
1997 was just unlucky, and 1999 might have been something, but after that, he kind of had that same thing we talked about when I did a similar video on Fisichella. Fizzy was just in the wrong place at the wrong time with teams and when he was born, whereas Frentzen was in the right place, but it just didn't work out. He did, however, need a specific atmosphere in which to thrive, and had he had a Jordan-type atmosphere at Williams, he probably could have done much better. But then it wouldn't have been Williams, and he probably wouldn't have achieved anything anyway. But I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments, and get a discussion going. And while scrolling down, if you think I've made some good points or otherwise taught you something new here today, then do give the video a like, and for more stuff like this, get subscribed with that bell on so you never miss out on anything I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk at Patreon for the support, and if you want to help out with the buying up of images and things like that for these videos, then there's a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord and to my socials. Or there's super thanks down there too if you just want to buy me a beer or a coffee. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward, have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.